Welcome to the Zero to Five Million Dollar Podcast. I'm Sean Finder, and I'm with my co-host Ollie Whitfield. This show is brought to you by AutoClose, a vanilla soft company. Ollie, why don't you introduce today's guest, or even better yet, what we're going to be talking about today? Yeah, well, I thought we'd do something a bit different today. And uh, I don't know about you, Sean, but I find Reddit is really funny. Um, do you do you have Reddit or or not at all? I do, I do have Reddit, and I uh, I actually go okay. to it quite often. Oh, really? Right. Okay. I wonder if we hang out in the same subreddits. Uh, well, that'll be interesting. Maybe we'll do that one <laughs> offline for safety. But um, I've been in the sales Reddit and uh, I didn't actually know there was one, to tell you the truth. So I found one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, roughly questions that have been asked of the sales Reddit. And I want to see what we think about the answers. So um, so I've got a few to go through. You ready? Let's Let's jump right in. Right, so this one's called Looking for Advice on How to Start a Sales Team, and it's fairly long, so I might skip through a little bit of it. Uh, We're a sales provider for Amazon sellers, and uh, we help receive their shipments through distributors and manufacturers, uh, doing a bunch of the admin work there. We target high-volume sellers, what makes us different, and they list some of that stuff, but they're looking to start from literally zero. Have no people, no tools, nothing. So this is kind of like a broad strokes question, Sean. Where, where would you start? So the first thing I was starting, you know, I've learned this hard way, is before you even start or hire anyone in sales, make sure your company has some sort of processes in place, um, some sort of tech stack. Because the last thing you want to do is hire somebody, they come in and it's like, okay, well, now what do I do? So you got to have that process in place. Are you looking for inbound? Are you looking for outbound? Are you looking for them to be cold calling, emailing? phone, text, what are they trying to do? So make sure you have all those processes in place. But the other thing I would say about salespeople is sometimes it's not actually the best to hire the most experienced salesperson. Um, I always go after talent. Um, and and all you've heard this many, quite many times on the resume, I look for certain things to see if that salesperson has. And one is competitiveness. So one thing I would say, if you're looking to start a sales team, don't always just pick the person that's worked at, you know, IBM for three years or Salesforce for four years, et cetera. Look for somebody that you think is talented, but also coachable and that you can grow with. But what do you, what do you think, Ollie? Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. And as I'm just reading a bit more of the detail, because there's quite a lot to this post, actually, they've been doing some Google ads and that's helping, but uh, they're a bit worried about just throwing someone in. And, uh, and, and if, it's funny, they actually reference, I've heard that's a bad idea through multiple posts in this Reddit. And uh, some of the comments actually say the exact same thing. It's, first of all, you've got to have a baseline before you even try and put somebody else in there because inevitably they're just not going to pick it up and do it better than you yep. straight away because it's there. They'll just find that especially harder if there isn't anything. So, uh, so yeah, I definitely agree with that one. And one of the comments said, this is quite interesting. They're saying, when you're ready kind of saying what you're saying, I think there. Look for people who have the sales manager title in that kind of market and bring them across as a kind of first hire and opportunity to grow. What do you think of that? I think, I, I mean, I definitely agree with that. One thing that makes me think about it is one thing I always you know, say is um, if you are looking to hire, also look for somebody that might have done a few things. One, um, have they been in like support customer success? So have they learned all the other aspects of the business before they're going into sales? So have they built those relationships as a CSM? Um, as well as, you know, as I said, I always like to see people that I always say banks, but anyone that's actually done any sort of cold calling in the past, um, has experienced like telemarketing. Um, even if it was at a very young age, you know, the most important thing in sales is obviously building those relationships and what else can do, uh, how else can you do it without actually getting on the phone and speaking to people all the time? Because one thing you'll get used to is rejection. Um, and if you're not going to be able to get used to rejection, you will not be good in sales because you do not close every single deal that comes your way. Yeah. Okay. So I've got, I've got another one here, a bit, bit of a different tax is we're going to go through a few different types of topic here, which would be interesting. So it's called best practices for finding an AE role. So for those who don't know, account exec. So it's, it's again, fairly long. I'll kind of breeze through it. I've been crushing it in a full cycle sales role um, for about seven months now. I've been top three in the entire company with my book of business starting at zero when I began. It's all remote and I live in Austin in Texas where dozens of great companies have a lot of openings, especially in this past year or so. I'd imagine that's even more so. I know I can I know I can succeed in whatever sales role I'm put in, but with the seven months stint I've now got, I want to go up to the AE role and do better. There's lots of things like the OTE, the higher base, and all of those kinds of things. And gradually it's a career progression thing. 
but I know I don't know where to start and I don't think I'm going to get that where I am. That's an interesting one. Um, I, I'd love to know a bit more about what's going on where they are. But if you're on the market, Sean, you're, you're AE, I'm, I'm going to do it. You're kind of making a jump with other people who are in the same boat as you. Do you think the seven months is going to work against this person? I feel like it might. I think there's a lot of people who, if you're in the pile of resumes, you're going to be one of a lot. And the, the chances are a lot of them might have more than seven months. Yeah. You know, I usually say, especially if you're going to go from that SDR role or something into the AE, you need to have that 12 to 15 months. Because I always say you have to, you know, you got to build the foundation. You got to be able to do all that, that groundwork, um, all that SDR stuff before. So I do think if you've only been seven months, depends on the size of the company as well. If you're a smaller company, seven months might get you into that AE rule. But I usually like to look at 12 to 18 months. And, and you know, we do it all the time here. Um, one of the progressions you have is when you become an SDR at our company, um, you know, we try and mentor you, coach you, et cetera, that in a year from now, we're saying, okay, you're going to be an AE. So you're also learning, gives you time to shadow AEs. Um, but seven months is a little bit too soon because your first three months, you're just starting to learn your, your, your role now. And then you're doing it for four months, then you want to move on. Yeah, a little bit too short for my liking, Ollie. Yeah, it's interesting because they're full cycle at the moment. And at the bottom, again, as you were speaking, that I've read a bit more, they don't want to go into the SDR route because they've already shown being full cycle, they can do that part, albeit not 100% of the time. They have to be able to do both. So I get that. In in the exact same way, though, the AE role is kind of like taking 50% of what you do and doing it. That's the same as the SDR role, but I get the like career path logic to that. Interesting. I haven't seen too many full cycle people go just to AE. Normally, they go leader or manager or or something like that. That's that's a tricky one. Yeah, usually when you when you go full cycle, I mean, that's kind of when you, you usually go SDR to AE uh, or to full cycle. But yeah, no, that, that is a definitely an interesting one. I mean... Most people, when they when they are doing full cycle, where they're doing that whole thing, the next the next in the progression is to become maybe not director, but at least a manager, um, a sales manager. So I would say that would be the next. But again, you know, even become a sales manager nowadays, you know, you're not going to get it within a year. Most people are looking for at least, I would say, three years of experience and and doing all that groundwork because the people that are most successful in that manager and above those senior level positions have always typically been there, done that. Um, they've been in that role before they've done it. So when they go, cause as a manager, you have to be able to coach, you have to be a leader, you have to train, you have to mentor, you have to understand what your, your team is doing. And the only way to do it is if you've done it before. Yeah. And one of the comments says basically as much as well, it just came up two minutes ago, which is kind of funny. All right. So next one, this is kind of similar, but he's at uh, he or she, we don't know. They're at a slightly different stage of their career. So it says looking for my first job in sales. I've been told my entire life that I have the ability to work in sales and I've been applying without too much luck. My question is, how would I go from a good first timer uh, and do well in an interview? Uh, they're saying that they've not had too much luck in interviews. They seem to be getting them, but they're not doing too well in them. So first time person comes to you, they're, they're looking for their startup in sales. What could go wrong in an interview and what kind of would be a, a little tick mark on their, on their resume perhaps? So I think the most important thing that I would look at if somebody was trying to get into sales is A, and they haven't been in sales, is A, are they coachable? So if they're not coachable, then there's probably not going to be much luck in sales because especially if you don't have the experience, you're playing and learning yourself. You, as a, when you start in any role, you have to be able to be coachable if you have no experience. So um, that would be one I would look at. And two is um, I find you know salespeople in general, somebody can be very you know cocky. They can be arrogant. Um, you want people that are cocky, but you also want people that are humble and, and, and in that middle. So you want to make sure that that person that's coming in isn't a know-it-all, but is actually willing to change the way they, their mentality is um, and meet you in that in that kind of that middle. So I always look to see people that um, are persistent, are not annoying, are not too cocky, but are confident. Um, but that's what I look at um, when interviewing somebody that has. And I'm going through it right now. We're looking at somebody that has no sales experience to hire them for the sales team, but I'm not looking at their experience at all. I'm looking at, you know, are they coachable? Are they hard workers? And, you know, what is their kind of, you know, professional and prof professional career path? 
Yeah, and if you literally do not have experience, then you can't show that. So don't worry too much about it. That's just part of it. And they should see that in the resume. They're going to look at job history and they're going to see either it's your first job or you haven't got that and you can be upfront about it. Yep. What I did when I had my first ever interview, and not for sales, but I think it translates, I had no working history because I was just about to finish school. So I had to work out another way. And it was to be a, a marketing firm, like content person. So I'd written articles like sport match write-ups when I was a kid, just for a bit of fun, a bit of a hobby. I didn't think of it as a career thing, but I thought, well, I'll print out like two or three of these and just bring them, even if they don't care. At least that's something I did that probably none of the other interviewees would have done. And it turns out they did not do that and that I got the job. Whether those things, things are related or not, I don't know, but I, I couldn't draw an experience, so I had to find another way. So that's that one. Next one. This is a good one, Sean. You've actually just done this in the last two weeks and uh, you've dealt with this for a couple of years now. So it's treating a non-local SDR team. I work in a different territory to where my SDR and support team are based out of state. In past situations, if they were local, I'd have taken them out for dinners or bought them drinks, those types of things in person. But where they're far away and it's remote, I'm struggling for ideas on what to do. Uh, that kind of motivational side of things and performance, well done, team building, those types of things. What can I do? So I'm going straight to you because you've just done this. Yeah. So we did a team building out in Serbia uh, about two weeks ago now. Um, you know, it's my second time now seeing the team in four years. But what we do is, you know, during the holidays and stuff, we actually allow our team to go out without me. So they'll FaceTime me, but they'll go out. You know, the SDRs will go meet up um, in a certain part of Serbia. Our AEs will meet up. And they'll meet just without obviously me there, but they'll always FaceTime me and be part of the team. So the one thing I think we're, we have the luxury of now is Zoom um, video um, like we're doing right now is you can still not be with somebody, but can kind of feel like you're with that person. Like, for example, you know, Ollie and I have never met in person. But, you know, for example, if I met him next week in the UK, it would be like we've we've seen each other 100 times just because we see each other all the time on video. So there are different things you can do. You don't have to meet in person, but it is always nice to definitely meet in person. But I would say let your team have their own dinners, have their own get togethers. You know, if you do a holiday party in North America, let somebody take the initiative and do a holiday party in Serbia, Eastern Europe, UK, wherever it might be. Um, and that's really worked well for us because I know, for example, when I saw the team two weeks ago in Serbia, you know, it was like we didn't miss a beat. We all, it was like, it's been four years, but it was like, we still, you know, didn't miss a beat from the last four years. Yeah, that, that's a good one if you can get out and do that type of thing. Uh, some of the comments here are about, if I'm reading it, that they're suggesting things like the Starbucks gift cards and those types of things. I'm not going to knock those because that's perfectly normal. And uh, and you can do that to any employee, local yep. or not. But uh, I would say with that, just a bit of, bit of caution. Don't just assume everyone wants a Starbucks gift card or everyone wants Amazon. So for example, particularly Serbia, I don't think Amazon is as well known over there nope. so to say amazon haven't. gift card to our serbian team doesn't mean anything and not everyone drinks coffee <laughs> there you go yeah so as much as you can be individual giving me a pizza voucher is good giving you a steak voucher might be as good i know it's, I'll, it's the I'll same take the thing pizza voucher over the steak voucher Ollie. let's get that started, i thought babe. you would i thought you'd take that <laughs> you can't have both so you gotta pick yeah all right, cool. This one's, this one's going to be a bit interesting. I haven't heard of this type of thing. So uh, it looks like they're interviewing for a couple of roles and uh, it's an SDR job. They're asking to do a typing test, is the quote, and then a reading comprehension, uh, comprehension exam. Maybe I should take a reading comprehension exam for that readout. Am I being strung along? So basically they're saying, I've, I've been for a couple of interviews. I'm in a SaaS startup. I sell and uh, I'm looking at my options. I've been asked to do a typing test and reading comprehension exam. I'm not sure if this is normal. What the hell? Please help me. Uh, it, it is normal for some very large enterprise clients, uh, sorry, uh, companies, publicly traded companies. I remember I, before I became an entrepreneur, I actually was uh, with uh, trying to get a job with Salesforce. And I went through five interviews, all went well. And then I had to do a presentation to five people on a board. I was like, I'm doing a presentation. I'm building a PowerPoint deck. I have to do this whole presentation. I don't even have the job. Like I'm spending hours doing something and not getting paid for it. And it's for, to get the job. Um, so a lot, I know HubSpot, there's a lot of these big companies that you have to do a lot. So um, it wouldn't surprise me. However, if it's a startup or someone that's asking you to do that, I wouldn't get involved because that means they're just going to work you like a dog once you get in there. So make sure it is uh, an enterprise 
well-established, reputable, probably publicly traded company when if they're asking for that? Yeah, I've only been asked to do that once and it was for a major big company like national level um, so that I could get it. Anybody else, I think they'd have a bad intention behind it probably, but uh, but I haven't seen that too often. So, But, but yeah, I'm going to guess and go with what you said. Um, all right, next one we've got. This one and uh, maybe one more. Uh, this one is very long, so I'm definitely going to skim read it. I regret transitioning from SDR to AE at my new company, and I don't know what to do next. So it looks like short story. They started out of uh, college. They go to an SDR job doing mostly inbound selling at a software company. Sounds like they're doing very well. They then got an offer from somewhere or another. A former teammate asked them to come along to their new company, join as an AE. And it looks like the base was uh, pretty much 50% higher. So you can see why they've gone for it. But they're a couple months in now. It's a real struggle. They look like they're nowhere near quota and they're coming up close to it. And they don't know what to do next. So uh, there's a few angles for this one. I think always talking to the manager, the leader, um, provided they're worth their money, uh, that will never be a bad thing. They might suggest, you know what, maybe it was too early. Do we have an SDR job? Do we have a hybrid? Do we have something we can do with you here? That means you don't have to leave. And then, then if you do leave, you've always got, well, I've been in AE, but do I go back to being an SDR? And does that look good? Do I go and be an AE somewhere else? But will I do well there? You've got all sorts of questions if you do leave. So I think sort of step number one, try and sort out something internally, at least for now. And if you can't, then you've got to look elsewhere. But but I'm getting a bit stuck there, Sean. So what do you think? Yeah, I mean, you know, not it's AE is not meant for everybody. Some people like to be an SDR and just stay in SDR. It's different. When you get an AE, you have a quota. If you miss your quota, fine. You miss your quota again. Eh, you miss your quarter three times in a row, you might be fired. And you might be fired a lot quicker than you would as an SDR. And, and SDRs, if you, for example, you say inbound, it's, you know, the leads are just coming to you and it's already warm. They're ready. Uh, you're, you know, you're just pre-qualifying, doing discovery calls. But as an AE, it's, you got to, you got to get out there and you got to be persistent. You got to continue. You're also up against, you know, when it's, and as an SDR, the leads coming to you, they're interested. As an AE, well, now you're quoting some, you're doing a demo, but you're also going up against three, four competitors. It's a different ball game. Not meant for everyone. Um, you got to have a stomach for of the AE role. Whereas SDR role is obviously, if you're especially an inbound SDR, it's a lot. It's a lot different. So, um, you know, it, as I said, every role is not meant for everyone. being a manager at a company or a leader is not meant for everyone. Not everyone wants to manage people. Not everyone's good at managing people. But that's what leaders do. So uh, it all depends on where you want to go with your career path. Yeah, and to be honest, there's no shame in if you're just a great SDR, go be that. Even if it looks kind of bad on the resume, it's there's no shame in that. There's shame in carrying on and getting fired in a yep. year's time because you didn't pull the trigger on knowing what to do. Yep. So if, if you can work that out, do that. All right, last one. Uh, we're coming up to time here. So is it me, the territory, the company, something else? I'm an AE at a SaaS platform and I've been doing that for about nine months. In that time, I've been really struggling to close consistently. Um, so it looks like they're in the middle part of the US and they're noticing that other reps on the East and the West Coast are closing a lot more significantly. Uh, they're doing two to 300 cold calls a day. They're having good demos, but they don't feel like anybody actually comes through and buys in the end. It looks like their manager doesn't really give them much advice or coaching. They're debating leaving the company and they want your advice. I mean, move. Could be a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ideally, you know, you got to think uh, if you're selling something in New York where, you know, or LA where there, there potentially is a lot of money in certain parts of New York, and then you're selling something in, you know, for example, North or South Dakota, where people don't have as much money as people in New York, it's going to be a tougher sell, right? So depending on your area, we all know there's certain, you know, certain verticals. It'd be the same thing inside, you know, Autoclos and Vanilla Soft. If, if, uh, if we're selling a lot of insurance, um, and then we have another company that might be a very small vertical, you know, and, and I only give you the small vertical, it's tougher. So the only way is to really look at the market, um, see how big the market is, where you are. If the territory is the problem, you got to move territories. If it's the product or the, the vertical that you get, then you got to change the product vertical. But always before you start any position, look at to what look to see what your market can be. Um, so, you know, if, if there is potential A, um, and if not, um, I would make a move. 
Interesting. Um, that was the go-to thing in my brain you didn't even say. So maybe I'm wrong or maybe we we have different ways of thinking about it. Um, and I'm going through the comments. It doesn't look like anybody said this too. So this is uh, this is an interesting one. The fact that they said they were having, they're having demos, it sounds like the prospecting is working. So that that's a good thing. If they're not getting anywhere, then it could be more like the territory, the, the product. Maybe that's the problem or, or they're bad at prospecting. I don't know. But the fact that they are having demos tells me something's right and people aren't buying. Normally when people don't buy, but if they get down the process, it's a bad discovery, I found. Yep, yep. So it I could agree. be that, but they're not getting the advice from the manager. So I don't know how they fix that unless they take a massive effort to fix it themselves. But it is really hard to coach yourself because you don't think you're doing it wrong. So, so yeah, difficult one. I'd look at that first and then it sort of always staying where you are is not a bad thing if you can improve on your position then if you can't then you can see it go somewhere else like you said so yep yeah that's a tough one in agreement well we're out of reddits but i i thought that was pretty fun so i think we're gonna have to do this one again yeah that was a lot of fun it was a, it was a different uh, kind of episode but i want to uh thank everybody that came and, and joined and listened to us today um don't forget to give us a five-star review wherever you listen to this episode and continue to listen as we bring on more guests um ollie Thank you again and everyone else. See you soon.